good morning to everybody today. We have uh, the important session, the monthly session of the IHRS uh, meet for the DNB DM uh, fellows in training and the young electrophysiologists to orient them into this field of cardiac electrophysiology, which has been uh, going on now for quite some time. And then the coordinator has been Dr. Ashish Nabar. And we thank the IHRS for uh, encouraging us to go ahead with this uh, important monthly meeting orienting the youngsters to get into the field of uh, cardiac electrophysiology. And uh, we also are coordinating with the Medgami for uh, this. And then all these recordings that are being done, these monthly meetings, are available on the IHRS website, which you can always log in and then try and refer to in case you have missed this meeting and also available on the Medgami app. Thank you. And then let's start the session today. <clears throat> today is an important uh, meeting talking about an important aspect of cardiac electrophysiology, atrial fibrillation. We know this is the most common arrhythmia that anybody would probably be facing. I'm sure all of you youngsters will be seeing atrial fibrillation in its various multifaceted, various shapes and sizes. In India, it's been in the background of rheumatic heart disease, but as we have an aging population, we are realizing that there are more and more non-valvular AFIBs that are coming in. And the increased burden of atrial fibrillation is what will be probably the future. One of the biggest uh, cardiac disabilities associated with uh, atrial fibrillation, primarily stroke risk. Not only that, it also increases heart failure, it increases, it reduces your quality of life and has an impact on mortality. It seems to be the next big evil that the cardiologists are going to face. Electrophysiologists have been working on this for the last 70 years, trying to find a way out trying to understand the mechanism so that they can be able to treat it. Most of the arrhythmias are conquered with a 90-95% success rates and cure rates, whereas atrial fibrillation has still been the holy grail for the electrophysiologists, but much water has flown in the last 70 years and headway has been made thanks to the coming in of catheter-based ablations, which have brought about reason of the burden of atrial fibrillation. And, but again, persistent atrial fibrillation is still an issue with less success rates compared to paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Anyway, as the proceedings go today, we'll start realizing the, the progress that's been made in the field of atrial fibrillation. And today, I am very happy to say that we have a horde of uh, senior moderators joining us on this webinar. Dr. Uh, Venkat Tolakanali from Minnesota. He's, uh, I, he's my dear friend and I welcome him to this session. He is professor of medicine at the University of Minnesota and the chief cardiac electrophysiologist at the VA healthcare system. His expertise in complex ventricular tachyarrhythmias. He's been awarded the prestigious Young Ming Life uh, Time Educator Award. And he's, to his credit, multiple research papers and publications. And I welcome Dr. Uh, Venkat for sparing his time, especially because he's from Minnesota. And you know, Minnesota now is running late, 10, 10.30. I really thank him for participating in this important meeting. The next important... Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Venkat. I also invite Dr. Rakesh Yadav, senior professor from the prestigious All India Institute of Science, who has, again, a multifaceted personality. Uh, and he 
not only apart from his credit to various publications, he is at present the editor of the Indian Heart Journal and also secretary for the IHRS Indian uh, Heart Rhythm Society. I welcome Dr. Rakesh. And another important person that I would like to have today as a moderator is Dr. Satish, who is professor and head of electrophysiology from Sri Jayadeva Institute of Cardiology. Again, a very close friend and a performed electrophysiologist with a lot of publications and plenty of experience in cardiac electrophysiology, including ablation of atrial fibrillation. I welcome Dr. Satish. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that kind introduction. Without much delay, we would probably start the proceedings and we would have the first speaker, Dr. Omar, to give us a brief insight into atrial fibrillation before we go on to the management strategies. Dr. Omar, please. Yes, sir. Please start. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'll be speaking about the uh, brief introduction on the management of atrial fibrillation. So as we know, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation is quite high, and we have a significant atrial fibrillation burden uh, in India also. So the lifetime risk for atrial fibrillation is uh, one in three individuals. And uh, AFib is more common in males, and it's projected to increase in the elderly group. And the lifetime risk of AFib increases with the increasing risk factor burdens, such as the smoking, alcohol consumption being quite common nowadays. And uh, coming to the definition of atrial fibrillation uh, per se, it is a supraventricular tachyarrhythmia with uncoordinated atrial activity. Along with this, uh, we have consequently ineffective atrial contraction. So electrocardiographic characteristics of AFib include an irregularly irregular RR interval and absence of a distinct repeating P waves and uh, irregular atrial activations. This ECG clearly shows the RR interval being irregular and absence of distinct P waves. And the diagnosis of clinical AFib whether the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic, a dual lead standard ECG or a single lead ECG tracing for more than or equal to 30 seconds showing atrial fibrillation would make a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. And this is a class 1B recommendations. So there is an entity called the atrial high rate episode and subclinical atrial fibrillation. So basically, these patients have not been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, no surface uh, ECG tracing of atrial fibrillation. So the AHRE, these are detected by the uh, cardiac implantable electronic devices, which show a high atrial activity. So this must always be physician confirmed because it may be an artifact. So we should always uh, confirm it uh, before we label a patient to have AFib or, or just based on the AHRE. And uh, subclinical AFib, when the AHRE is confirmed to be an atrial fibrillation of flutter or atrial tachycardia, that's when we tell it as a subclinical AFib. So I would like to present a case here. So we had a patient who had a high atrial activity on the electrogram and we had another tracing of his uh, which was uh, showing a lot of atrial activity so we were uh, or we were just thinking about the management how to go about with this patient so we we went ahead with the fluoroscopy and the picture was clear it's a artifact uh, the electrogram was showing artifacts due to the atrial lead fracture as we can see clearly there's a atrial lead fracture the insulation has broken there, causing all of this. So whenever we get a patient with the AHRE, we see a high atrial activity, what should we do? So we should get an ECG done. So if the ECG does not show AFib, then we label this patient as subclinical atrial fibrillation. 
And if the ECG shows the atrial fibrillation, then he's uh, diagnosed to be a patient having atrial fibrillation and he's a clinical AF and the management is the same for the clinical AF as, you, as what we routinely prescribed. So I would like to show a recent trial which was done uh, uh, with the patients having the AHRE. So should we anticoagulate the patients? That is the big question here. So this trial actually showed that uh, the patients who were on anticoagulation uh, did not benefit much uh, in terms of cardiovascular death, stroke, and or systemic embolization uh, as compared to a placebo. And in fact, they had a higher rate of bleeding and uh, of death. So the incidence for stroke was low in both groups. But uh, uh, the recent, the most latest uh, uh, trials and the most recent publication from the circulation uh, tells us clearly that for patients having AHRE episodes, which are lasting for more than or equal to 24 hours and with a CHADVAS score more than or equal to two, it is reasonable to initiate oral anticoagulation. They will benefit from the oral anticoagulation. This is a two-way recommendation. And for patients having AHRE, which is lasting between five minutes to 24 hours with a CHADVAS score more than or equal to three, then the class of recommendation is 2B for initiating anticoagulation. So who are the patients who would not require anticoagulation are patients having AHRE episodes lasting less than five minutes and without any other indication for anticoagulations. So these patients should, lift, uh, should be left alone without anticoagulation. So we have a lot of screening uh, devices right, to, right now, like our smartwatches, smartphones, all are able to detect, uh, you know, a single lead ECG showing atrial fibrillation. Uh, but the caveat here is uh, it has uh, high sensitivity, but uh, relatively less specificity. So it must be physician confirmed always. So coming to the AFib stages, so first stage is uh, when patients are at risk for atrial fibrillation, having risk factors, be, some are being modifiable like the obesity and others and non-modifiable like genetics, male sex and age. And stage two is uh, pre-AF. So pre-AF is that patient are having the evidence of structural or electrical findings further predisposing a patient to atrial fibrillation like atrial enlargement and others. And uh, so who are the patients uh, who are having AFib are uh, stage three. So in this, we have three A, B, C, D. So A is when AFib is intermittent and terminates within seven days of onset. And uh, three B is persistent AFib. Uh, it is a continuous AFib which sustains for more than seven days and does require intervention. And the long-standing persistent AFib was a 3C. So these are patients having AFib continuously for more than 12 months of duration. And successful uh, AFib ablation, this is 3D. Patients uh, get freedom from atrial fibrillation after percutaneous or surgical intervention to eliminate atrial fibrillation. So who are the patients who are known as permanent AFib? So permanent AFib is a, actually a term when we uh, use when the patient and the physician both have decided that no further attempts will be made to try the rhythm control strategy. So diagnostic workup and follow-up. So for all patients with atrial fibrillation, a thorough medical history is required, a dual lead ECG, thyroid function, kidney function test, electrolytes, and full, full blood count and uh, a transthoracic echocardiography is must in all AFib patients. And in selected patients, uh, they may benefit from uh, ambulatory ECG monitoring, uh, TEE, and uh, high sensitivity cardiac troponins, and uh, coronary CTA, brain CTA, MRI, and uh, LG CMR of the left atrium. And we should have a structured follow-up. So how do we approach patients with atrial fibrillation? So CC to ABC are easy mnemonic. Uh, C for confirm the AFib diagnosis. C for characterizing the AFib. We have a 4S AF scheme. So stroke risk, 
by CHADWAS score. Symptom severity, we can use the EHRA symptom score and severity of AFib burden by seeing the duration and spontaneous termination and substrate severity, age, comorbidities, and others. Uh, so how do we treat AFib? ABC pathway, it is as simple as ABC. So A is for anticoagulation and avoid stroke. So we should use the CHADWAS score uh, to, to know which patients require anticoagulation and who do not require anticoagulation. And we must use the ASPLET score to determine the bleeding risk and to modify any modifiable bleeding risk. So we should choose an oral anticoagulant and obviously Novax, as we know, are better than vitamin K antagonists, except in two situations, that is prosthetic valves and uh, moderate to severe mitral stenosis. So B is for better symptom control. So we have to optimize the rate control and consider rhythm control strategy. And C is comorbidities and cardiovascular risk factor management. So we should uh, tell the patients to have a good lifestyle. So that is uh, also very important in reducing the atrial fibrillation burden. So this is the uh, CHADWAS score. As we can see, each score, each point increases the annual stroke risk. So CHADWAS score is a very important score. It must be done in all atrial fibrillation patients. Not only it tells us the annual stroke risk, but also guides us uh, the therapy, which patients require anticoagulations and which patients would not benefit from anticoagulation. So how frequently should we uh, reassess the patient? Three to four months may be a reasonable time interval at which the stroke risk should be reassessed so that we can timely prescribe the oral anticoagulants. So HASPLET score as a systematic review and other evidence has clearly shown that it's the best prediction it gives the best prediction for the bleeding risk. But here I would like to make a statement that high bleeding risk score is not an excuse to withhold oral anticoagulation. Patient requires it. Even with a high uh, has blood score, we have to initiate if the patient requires it. So finally, I would like to uh, conclude by telling that AFib management is a holistic management in which the primary care is involved, the primary GP is involved, the non-cardiologist, the cardiologist, as well as the patient is involved in the uh, management of uh, atrial fibrillation. And lastly, uh, ABC is so easy. Uh, so we just have to remember A for avoid stroke and B for better symptom management and C for comorbidities and cardiovascular risk factor optimization. This simple strategy, I'm pretty sure, is going to reduce the atrial fibrillation burden. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Omar, for that uh, wonderful introduction into the management of atrial fibrillation. I think uh, now we would have... Uh, we, we, we need to really understand uh, paroxysmal versus persistent and... Uh, paroxysmal or persistent with heart failure and how we approach it. Primarily, it's all dependent on the patient choice. All indications, even the latest uh, ACC guidelines which have come in and the earlier ESC, all of them give importance to patient's choice. Patient is symptomatic. He goes for effective treatment in the form of catheter ablation, which has a class 2A recommendation, or you use antiarrhythmic drugs. In case you have persistent atrial fibrillation, the catheter ablation is a class 2B indication. Antiarrhythmic drugs are again looked at primarily as the first line of treatment. But when you have heart failure and you know atrial fibrillation is causing arrhythmia-induced cardiomyopathy, probably that time it could have a class 1A indication to look at ablation as the primary first line of treatment rather than wait for the drugs to work and obviously patients will start worsening. Failed drug therapy, definitely it has a class 1A uh, uh, application in both the uh, recommendations, ESC guideline and today the latest ACC guidelines. So I now request uh, Dr. Varsha to take us ahead with regard to catheter-based ablation or atrial fibrillation. Thank you, sir. Yeah.
please share your slides. Yes, sir. A very good morning to one and all present here. So my topic for today is catheter ablation in patients with atrial fibrillation. I'll be giving a brief overview of all the indications for catheter ablation in patients with AFib. I will be covering it in the following uh, headings. Rhythm control in patients with AFib firstly. Then types of ablation methods that are present today. Catheter ablation in patients with paroxysmal AFib as first line in patients with AFib its role in persistent AFib. And finally, I would like to discuss our experience uh, when we treated a patient with atrial fibrillation. So coming to rhythm control in patients with atrial fibrillation, the two latest trials which have shown that rhythm control in patients with AFib is useful is the EAST AFNET and the Athena trial. The EAST AFNET trial considered recent onset AFib patients who were at higher risk of stroke, while the Athena trial considered both paroxysmal and persistent AFib patients. In the EAST AFNET trial, their rhythm control strategy was either antiarrhythmic drugs or ablation, while in the Athena trial, they looked at only dronidurone, that is antiarrhythmic drugs for uh, 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 rhythm control. And in the East AF net, they found that the primary endpoint that was a composite of death from cardiovascular causes, stroke or hospitalization because of worsening heart failure occurred less often among patients who were treated either with antiarrhythmic drugs or ablation. And the same outcome was also found in the Athena trial, indicating that early rhythm control among patients with AFib does have a role in the treatment. This is the latest ACCHA guidelines, which was released on November 30th or recently, uh, which shows which are the patients uh, in whom you would prefer rhythm control. This is if the patient's choice is to prefer rhythm control, you can give them that option. Or if the age of the patient is younger, like less than the age of 65 years, or if the history of AFib is shorter, or if patients are more symptomatic for AFib, or if it is difficult to control the heart rate, coming to the anatomy, if the LA is smaller, there is more LV dysfunction and these are the conditions in which we would prefer rhythm control over uh, rate control. This was a JAK review paper, which stated that as of yesterday and even today, Clinicians worldwide, if patients present with paroxysmal AFib, if they are symptomatic, they first opt for rate control before going on to rhythm control. But they say that the way forward is that rate control should be the last strategy. We have to start the treat patient on treatment with rhythm as well as rate control. This rhythm control can be either in the form of antiarrhythmic drugs or ablation. But we know that antiarrhythmic drugs come with their own adverse effects. So what are the advantages of catheter ablation over antiarrhythmic drugs? Uh, this was a paper published in 2023, which said that if catheter ablation is performed by trained operators, it is a safe and superior alternative to antiarrhythmic drugs for the maintenance of sinus rhythm as well as symptom improvement. It has also been shown to prevent modification of the anatomy of the heart secondary to AFib. So as per the ESA guidelines published in 2020, what are the indications for catheter ablation? As first line, they say that it is only in patients with paroxysmal AF episodes of persistent AF, but even here they give it only a class uh, 2A and 2B indication. A class 1 indication is only given among patients who have tachycardia induced uh, heart failure, that is patients who develop heart failure secondary to uh, AFib. Only here it is given a class one indication for first line management. Among patients who have failed therapy with antiarrhythmic drugs, uh, they say that uh, 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 catheter ablation can be used to treat paroxysmal as well as persistent AFib. And only here it is given a class one indication. What do the latest ACCHA guidelines say? Catheter ablation again is given a class one indication among patients in whom antiarrhythmic drugs were ineffective or they say that it can be chosen as first-line therapy in selected patients. Now, who are these selected patients? They are patients who are younger, who have few or no comorbidities. Now, coming to uh, radiofrequency ablation per se, uh, with a uh, focus on pulmonary vein isolation. Why is it that the pulmonary veins came into focus in atrial fibrillation? This was because of a seminal paper that was published by uh, Dr. Michelle Hasagure, which stated that pulmonary veins are an important source of ectopic beats, which initiate frequent paroxysms of atrial fibrillation. And he also stated that these foci respond to treatment with radiofrequency ablation. 
So these are the foci that are present in the pulmonary veins, which send out electrical impulses, capture the left atrium and lead to atrial fibrillation. And this is pulmonary vein isolation, where we electrically isolate the pulmonary vein from the left atrium, preventing this triggering focus from entering into the left atrium and causing AFib. Uh, as per the ACC guidelines, again, they say that pulmonary vein isolation among patients undergoing uh, AFib ablation is given a class 1 indication. But for other anatomic ablation targets, such as posterior wall sites, ablation of low voltage areas or ablation of cafe areas, it gives a 2B indication, saying that it is not really useful uh, in doing these methods among patients undergoing uh, ablation. So these were the different methods that were used for AFib ablation. Few are for paroxysmal, few are for persistent AF. Now only highlighting the what were the methods that were done for paroxysmal AFib. This was focal ablation of pulmonary vein triggers, segmental ostial pulmonary vein isolation, and circumferential anterior pulmonary vein isolation. Now what are each of these? Focal ablation of pulmonary vein triggers is where you just go and identify the areas where the pulmonary veins are firing and you go and ablate these areas. However, this is a technique that is now out of fashion. It is not used anymore. The other methods that are used are segmental ostial pulmonary vein isolation, where you can see that only a few areas around the pulmonary veins, where we see a, a a link between the pulmonary vein and the left atrium, only these areas are ablated. The other method is circumferential pulmonary vein isolation, where circumferentially around each of the pulmonary veins, radio frequency ablation is done. But a newer technique that has been found to be useful is wide anterior pulmonary vein isolation, where we circumferentially isolate uh, two pulmonary veins on either side instead of uh, uh, isolating each pulmonary vein one by one. So this was a review article that was published in 2015, which uh, aimed to compare wide anterior pulmonary vein isolation versus ostial pulmonary vein isolation. It aimed to compare long-term arrhythmia-free survival, and it showed that outcomes were better in terms of arrhythmia-free survival among patients who were subjected to wide anterior pulmonary vein isolation than compared to ostial pulmonary vein isolation. This was a SMART AF trial which aimed to assess the outcomes when a paroxysmal AF ablation was done using a contact force sensing catheter. And here they found that the irrigated contact force sensing catheter is a safe and effective alternative for treatment of drug refractory AFib. And there are very few device related complications. However, they also highlighted the fact that Stable contact force during ablation is required for favorable outcomes at 12 months. Highlighting this point was another study which showed that uh, the uh, arrhythmia-free survival at one year was 80% when the contact force catheter was within the pre-selected contact force range for more than 80% of the time. Now, coming to the types of ablation, until now we have spoken about radio frequency ablation, where this is the circular mapping catheter placed at the ostium of the pulmonary vein, and this is the uh, irrigated open tip catheter. These are the radio frequency lesions that have been given. This is the cryo balloon, which is used for cryo ablation, which is also a method of doing pulmonary vein isolation. Now, the difference between the two is in cryo balloon ablation, it freezes and damages the tissue, while in uh, radio frequency ablation, it heats and burns the tissue. Issue. Now, what did the trial say about the outcomes in uh, pulmonary vein isolation with radio frequency ablation versus cryo balloon ablation? The three main trials that were done were the freeze AF, the fire and ice, and the circa dose trial. All these showed that cryo ablation was non inferior to radio frequency ablation in terms of outcome. The outcomes were freedom from AF complications and re recurrence of uh, supraventricular arrhythmias uh, over a period of 12 to 18 months. Next, coming to catheter ablation as first-line management in AFib, we have seen in the guidelines that they give a class 1 indication only among patients who have tachycardia-induced heart failure or among patients who have failed antiarrhythmic drugs. But is there any use of doing catheter ablation before putting the patients onto antiarrhythmic drugs? Let us see what what uh, it says. Uh, the studies have been done with radio frequency as well as cryoablation. This was a meta-analysis that was done which assessed catheter ablation as first-line treatment for paroxysmal AFib and it found that catheter ablation was superior to antiarrhythmic drug therapy in patients with symptomatic paroxysmal AFib. 600 patients were divided into two uh, groups here. There were six 600 patients in each group, and they found, like I said, catheter ablation is superior to antiarrhythmic drug therapy. 
this was another meta analysis which again aimed to compare ablation versus antiarrhythmic drugs in terms of recurrence of atrial tachyarrhythmias at one year here ablation was either cryoablation or radio frequency ablation and here again you can see that the outcomes were better among patients who underwent ablation than among patients who were treated with antiarrhythmic drugs the trials for radio frequency ablation in first line management of afib were the raft one the mantra paf and the raft 2 trial which initially showed that radio frequency ablation was more effective in preventing arrhythmia recurrence however the studies also said that benefit was relatively limited and the results did not translate into clinically meaning meaningful improvements in quality of life though the risk of recurrence was lesser quality of life among these patients did not improve much This was the three-year outcome of the early AF study, where cryoablation was done as first line in patients with AFib, and here they showed that there was significantly lower lower recurrence of atrial arrhythmias, a uh, lower progression to persistent AFib, lower hospitalization, greater improvement in quality of life, lower rate of adverse effects, as well as significantly lower AF burden. This was a critical appraisal of all the three cryoablation trials that were done among patients as first line for atrial uh, atrial fibrillation ablation. Here you can see that there was reduced atrial tachyarrhythmia recurrence. There was greater improvement in quality of life, reduced healthcare utilization, as well as reduced hospitalization. Saying that cryoablation can be used as first line among patients with uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. now we have spoken about uh, catheter ablation in paroxysmal afib and catheter ablation as first line in afib but what do the trials say about persistent afib this at present is an electrophysiologist waterloo as we all know so while treating patients with persistent afib we generally require a combination of 3d mapping and radio frequency ablation but single procedural efficacy and long term outcome still remains suboptimal especially uh, among those with persistent or long standing afib among paroxysmal afib the outcomes are close to 60 to 80% while in persistent or long standing it is 50% or less so these were all the ablations that were attempted along with pulmonary vein isolation pulmonary vein isolation is the standard even today these were the other ablation methods that were tried and here you can see that the level of evidence was weak for cafe ablation firm ablation uh, all the other ablations and there was slightly stronger level of evidence for posterior wall isolation and superior vena cava isolation so this is where just in brief this was pulmonary vein isolation this was isolation of the posterior wall this was the cafe ablation where we ablated the complex fragmented atrial uh, egms and this was a uh, pulmonary vein isolation along with isolation of the mitral annulus this was scar guided isolation this was a uh, pulmonary vein isolation with left atrial appendage isolation and this was svc isolation now did any of these Uh, show any benefit in the outcomes in patients with persistent afib as per the accha guidelines all these have been given a class 2b indication there was also a trial called the star af2 trial which included nearly 600 patients with afib and they aim to see if pulmonary vein isolation alone or with any of these other methods helped improve the outcomes among patients with persistent afib so one group was only pulmonary vein isolation alone the other was isolation with cafe ablation while the other was pulmonary vein with a uh, linear ablation across the left atrial roof and the mitral valve annulus the follow up was for 18 months but this was a negative trial which showed that there was no reduction uh, among rates of recurrent atrial fibrillation among any of the groups indicating that apart from pulmonary vein isolation no other ablation strategies have been found to be useful in fact it also showed that there was increased risk of uh, focal arrhythmias uh, among these patients who underwent uh, higher uh, or more um, areas of ablation so uh, this is just a table showing this is how the cardiac muzzle looks among patients with paroxysmal afib here they only have triggering ectopic foci usually along the pulmonary veins the anatomy remains preserved among persistent afib along with triggering uh, uh, um, ectopic foci there is also beginning of remodeling and fibrosis while among long standing persistent af there is extensive atrial fibrosis and electrical remodeling with or without triggers this basically goes to show that we have to intervene early among patients with afib the minute we identify them as paroxysmal afib we have to intervene early and treat them preferably with rhythm control and catheter ablation versus rate control because the more we delay the more there is anatomical damage that occurs and it is more difficult to treat patients with persistent 
persistent or long standing persistent afib this is a meta analysis basically to show that even post ablation antiarrhythmic drugs are essential this was in paroxysmal afib this is persistent afib the blue were the patients who were uh, uh, treated without medications while the orange was patients who were treated with medications and the average afib burden you can see over a period of time was lower among patients who were treated with medication and ablation than among patients who were treated only with uh, ablation uh, this uh, is for paroxysmal this is for persistent afib and we can see that the outcomes are the same now coming to the case study uh, this was a 56 year old male patient who had recurrent episodes of drug refractory paroxysmal afib for the last uh, nearly one and a half years he was taken up for ep study plus rfa this is the uh, ep tracing where here you can see is the left atrial impulses while this is the pulmonary vein impulses that you can see now how do you identify the pulmonary vein signals usually the pulmonary vein signals are generally spike like and they are sharp uh, while compared to the la signals which are broader and higher voltage uh, egms and they usually have an extensive or circumferential distribution and usually the distribution is proximal to distal so here you can see that they are taller longer spikes and they have an extensive circumferential distribution then compared to these egms which are broader and they have only a very focal distribution now why is it important to differentiate between the pulmonary vein potentials or the extra pulmonary vein potentials is to avoid unnecessary ablation and reduce the risk of complications while doing uh, ablation so this is how you mainly differentiate pulmonary vein from extra pulmonary vein potentials focusing on this diagram this is a patient in sinus rhythm this is the signals from the left superior pulmonary vein this is the pulmonary vein signals and this is a signal from the left atrial appendage here you can see that the two are merging so you differentiate this by pacing from certain areas of the heart such as the proximal cs distal cs or the left atrial appendage here you can see when the left atrial appendage is spaced there is splitting of the signals uh, the la uh, appendage signals are seen first and then you see the pulmonary vein signals the same you can see here as well in sinus there is fusion of the signals when you do proximal cs distal cs or la appendage pacing there is splitting of the signals what you see more extensive and taller spikes are the pulmonary vein potentials uh, when compared to focally distributed far field signals this is post ablation where pacing from the proximal cs you can see only the left atrial appendage signals uh, but you cannot see the pulmonary vein signals indicating that we have successfully uh, isolated electrically the pulmonary vein from the left atrium this is similar the this was from the left superior pulmonary vein this is similar from the left inferior pulmonary vein where the far field signals or the extra pulmonary signals will be the lower left atrium again here you differentiate by distal cs spacing and proximal cs spacing so this is in our patient here you can see the pulmonary vein potentials but these disappeared after ablation indicating that we had successfully uh, electrically isolated the pulmonary vein uh, from the left uh, atrium so the patient was stable and free of symptoms however 3 months later he presented again with palpitations so uh, we wanted to make sure that he did not have a recurrence of uh, atrial fibrillation and we wanted to make sure that the pulmonary vein signals were not coming into the la to cause afib again uh, this was the ecg that uh, we saw this mainly looked like a clockwise typical atrial flutter so this is where we mapped the a uh, left atrium and here you can see that when the catheter was placed in the pulmonary vein the uh, there was absence of signals in indicating that uh, uh, the pulmonary vein was uh, properly electrically isolated from the left atrium so we went ahead and we mapped the right atrium and uh, finally we identified the patient to have a clockwise typical atrial flutter so we uh, successfully ablated the cable tricuspid isthmus the patient is still on follow up with us and he is symptomatically uh, free and quality of life has also improved this is about radio frequency ablation and uh, cryo balloon ablation now the new kid on the block is something known as pulsed field ablation how does this work this uses electrical pulses to cause non thermal irreversible electroporation to induce cardiac cell death now these are all the catheters that have been brought into the market for pulsed field ablation what is mainly used is the farapulse catheter now what does this 
uh, pulse field ablation do that is different from radio frequency or cryo balloon ablation is that it only damages the cardiac tissue it does not damage the surrounding structures in cryo balloon ablation and radio frequency ablation you can see that there is damage to the esophagus as well as the phrenic nerve while this is not seen in pulse field ablation there is also an important complication uh, called stiff la syndrome where the la compliance is reduced further following catheter ablation in extreme cases leading to increased filling pressures with pulmonary hypertension. This was a study that was done which aimed to assess the significance of first if LA syndrome. Uh, this included mainly 1,380 patients. This mainly showed that stiff LA syndrome is a rare but a significant important complication that must be kept in mind among patients undergoing uh, atrial fibrillation ablation. And mainly this is LA diastolic dysfunction with pulmonary hypertension. So what is the role of pulse field ablation in different forms of atrial fibrillation? Has it been found to have a role? This was a one-year outcome of three studies that were done, the IMPULSE, the PEFCAT, and the PEFCAT-2 trial in paroxysmal AFib. This study was published in 2021, and it showed that uh, pulse field ablation catheter, uh, uh, where we did pulmonary vein isolation, resulted in excellent pulmonary vein isolation durability and there was acceptable low uh, acceptable safety with a low one year rate of atrial arrhythmia recurrence this is among patients with persistent AFib where they mainly aim to assess the safety and lesion durability. Here, patients uh, both underwent pulmonary vein isolation and uh, LA posterior wall ablation in persistent AFib. When they remapped after three months to assess the durability of the lesion, they found that uh, the lesion was durable and it was uh, isolated in 96% of patients who underwent uh, pulmonary vein isolation and 100% of patients who underwent uh, LA posterior wall ablation showing that pulse field ablation may also have a role in patients with persistent AFib. This is the summary of all the data that was uh, presented in 2023 for pulse field ablation. The manifest PF, the CE mark, and the pulsed AF trial, which showed that freedom from uh, any kind of uh, tachyarrhythmia at one year, both in paroxysmal and persistent AF, was close to 75 to 80%. This is the emerging technologies in pulmonary vein isolation for patients with AFib. Uh, we are mainly trying to discover newer energy sources, trying to bring in newer hardware such as multi-electrode ablation catheters or newer hardware in radio frequency ablation itself or better methods to visualize the lesion to uh, overcome our drawbacks that are present in the present way of treating patients with atrial fibrillation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Varsha, for that elaborate insight into managing uh, atrial fibrillation with catheter ablation and with the limitations that we have with the drug therapy. I would now invite our esteemed moderators to give their uh, thoughts and share their insights for the audience benefit and uh, uh, Dr. Venkat, can I have your inputs, please? Thank you so much. First of all, I congratulate the speakers for doing an extensive, um, you know, elaborated discussion, both uh, in terms of what we actually seeing uh, the atrial high rate episodes with uh, device detected atrial fibrillation, which has become a topic of interest and uh, topic of, uh, uh, you know, debate. Uh, recently by the new trials which were presented at the AHA and um, as well as the um, the extensive uh, discussion. I mean, almost you wrote it, gave, gave us a review article, Dr. Prakash. You know, I think that was a huge, huge amount of, uh, you know, material that you actually presented. Uh, excellent presentation for both of you. Um, few things to um discuss about this atrial high rate episodes. We were a part of the trend study, very original study which, we, which was done. Uh, all along, a certain trends were uh, showing evidence that I think we are looking at atrial fibrillation for what is the six hour episode or less than six hour episode. What does it really mean? This is becoming a consistent uh, debate. And uh, as we know that I think uh, there is uh, some sort of a discrepancy if the patient is lucky enough to show up in a clinic and uh, as a 12 ECG showing evidence of atrial fibrillation, you make a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, whether they are symptomatic or not. And based on the risk uh, factor profile, you decide 
uh, to um, intervene in the form of uh, anticoagulation as a first line therapy for stroke prevention. But why is it not the case if you are dead, dead, seen through a device? Uh, that's one of the debates nobody know, knew how reliable is this atrial fibrillation aspect with respect to what we see through the device anticoagulating on a long term. And uh, this led to all these, these, these two trials which were presented. And it is obviously, it's not showing as much as we thought it would possibly with respect to what we see. There is uh, another side of the story for this problem, which is uh, increasingly um, interesting concept being the atrial myopathy concept. And this atrial myopathy, uh, Ming Lang Sheng has put in a lot of effort in aspect from, uh, I think, um, you know, in uh, from Nanjing, and he has put in a lot. And then in, uh, in my own colleague, Lini Chen, uh, who has actually worked a lot in this aspect uh, through the uh, ERIC study, uh, looking at the atrial myopathy as a context. So besides all these factors, I think one of the other uh, things which we are also seeing increasingly seen is um, the uh, amyloidosis. You know, we are seeing the aging population, we are seeing the senile amyloid is becoming a huge issue, especially here in the United States, I think, because uh, we are seeing more aging population as such. And uh, even if you don't see atrial fibrillation, the atrium is uh, is not really moving. You know, we, we actually see that quite often, actually. Then where do you see, okay, you are not anticoagulating because they're in sinus rhythm, but you are anticoagulating, not anticoagulating, even if you have the device detected atrial fibrillation. So what is the reason? The chaps 2 vas core is inherently has got a, is a weak concept. It's just like ejection fraction assessment, you know, in patients uh, with uh, sudden cardiac arrest. It's very, it's, a, it's actually a moving target. Over a period of time, I think, as we understand more and more of the atrial myopathies, I think things may change as far as how we are going to uh, approach. Currently, as you outlined with respect to how we manage in patients with atrial fibrillation through the device detected, uh, um, you know, atrial fibrillation, high rate episodes, um, you know, at least 24 hours uh, minimum to see uh, some effect, whether, you know, the uh, you see the post-atrial fibrillation episodes where you actually see um, in the atrium that electromechanical dissociation happens and you decide to do anticoagulation is what I think we are kind of concluding at this point of time. These are all the obvious, there is a, not a class one indication, it becomes much more in the class two range, whether it's A or B. Um, regarding the uh, Dr. Prakash's uh, talk, I think it was excellent. I, and I don't know where to start to really talk about because it's such an extensive discussion that actually went through. Um, there are a few things I would possibly pinpoint with respect to what we understand in the rhythm management. If you really historically look at how things happen, race for a trial and a firm trial, for several years, I think we were all concentrating saying, well, rhythm management is not necessarily needed. What we need to do is, uh, I think in terms of rate control is as good as rhythm management. Part of the problem was, even if you take the uh, set of patients who were managed in the uh, rate and affirm trial patients, a lot of patients were actually in sinus rhythm in the rate control strategy. So that tells you, I think the trial had inherently had a problem. Now, having said that, it is not the only reason. The other reason being, we did not have good choices with respect to what we could do for atrial fibrillation as the rhythm management is concerned. So the things have evolved over a period of time. And with the East AFNet 4 trial, which came on, both the subset of the heart failure population with a composite endpoint getting better in those group of patients, as well as the atrial fibrillation category in the younger population, things are looking in a different angle now. And especially the other uh, layer to it is the heart failure, the CASEL uh, AF trial, uh, as well as the HTX trial. Now we are actually facing a lot more. I think it, that's probably one of the biggest heat uh, which is we are actually experiencing. Although, having said that, we have already identified quite a few of these patients, uh, early rhythm management seem to have a better outcome with respect to clinical outcomes. Mortality reduction is obviously a big question. That's not, we can uh, easily were able to show, I was a part of the Cabana trial too. Uh, there was a lot of uh, slow in enrollment in those, in the group of patients that we um, had to struggle in the, this group of patients. We know that the subset of heart failure population actually did very well in that trial as well. 
So as you rightly pointed out, uh, John Cam's article looking at uh, you know the probably the next era of how we are going to do approach these group of patients is the early rhythm management as opposed to uh, doing a, a rate control strategy. I think is going to come. I think uh, in our own practice we have changed a lot over a period of time, and uh, our uh, uh, we are looking at a little bit more into the early rhythm management a lot more commonly. Um, especially in the heart failure population, both in preserved as well as the reduced dejection fraction. And with the new technology development of the new um, um, you know, modalities of treatment in the form of pulse field ablation, although pulse field ablation showed not hugely different from catheter with respect to the overall outcome among 25,000 patients, which was presented in the, you know, the one comparative study back in last heart rhythm society in the dead breaking trials. Um, it has got it some benefit with respect to collateral damage issue. So overall, I think as the, the evolution in the technology, what we are seeing, I think there is a room to it. Having said that, one point I would like to make before I give uh, uh, Dr. Prakash to take over is um, it, the arrhythmia-induced cardiomyopathy is a very misnomer. We can actually think about it. I'll, I'll tell you why atrial fibrillation, even rate-controlled atrial fibrillation, is an arrhythmia actually. So the reason why I say that is because we also looked at our, our data in this group. The RR dispersion is good enough to cause exactly what you see with a PVC-induced cardiomyopathy in the form of a calcium loading mechanism issues with um, uh, you know the circa uh, 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 uptake inhibition. So in that way, I think we what to do is we need to intervene early in this group of patients as well. As you late delay, there's a lot of left atrial fibrosis. And you know they it becomes futile to actually consider how you can treat this group of patients as well. Thank you so much. Excellent uh, <clears throat> review by Dr. Venkat, as expected. Thank you, thank you for that insight into uh, the nuances of managing atrial fibrillation. And uh, thanks, thanks for your uh, valuable opinion and experience that you've had. Uh, could I invite Dr. Satish also to make a few comments before we move on to the next talk? <clears throat> I, I like to congratulate both the speakers for the excellent uh, presentation. And uh, as they rightly told, uh, the presently AFI management is uh, moving from uh, rate to rhythm control. It's mainly due to improvement in the ablation technology, as well as with the single shot technology, the results are uh, improving. And the procedure also is becoming safer. And uh, I like to thank, and that's what I want to say. Thank you. So you're on mute. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that insight, Dr. Satish. Uh, wonderful. Let's move on to the next talk. As Dr. Venkat was talking, the RR intervals and the calcium loading is what really makes uh, atrial fibrillation an important cause for, uh, uh, for cardiomyopathy. And that, let's look at what we have in store for patients with AFib and heart failure. Dr. Uh, Suhas, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me start with my topic. Uh, topic for today being heart uh, atrial fibrillation and heart failure. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Sohas presenting my topic, atrial fibrillation and heart failure. Uh, let me start with a case history, uh, which is 58-year-old male uh, who presented with complaints of breathlessness for 15 days, which was progressive in nature, function uh, progressing from NYHI class 2 to NYHI class 4, associated with bilateral lower limb swelling for 15 days. He had no history of chest pain or palpitations. Uh, we got an ECG done, which shows atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular rate and an echo was done. Here we can see that there is atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular rate as well as reduced LV function. Uh, now we know that very, uh, in this patient, we have atrial fibrillation as well as fa with fast ventricular rate and heart failure. Now, we, uh, both AFib can lead to heart failure and heart failure can cause AFib. Now, how does heart failure lead to AFib? That is, uh, in heart failure, there can be increased filling pressures leading to myocardial fibrosis, 
chamber re uh, chamber remodeling neurohormonal activation disruption in calcium metabolism and also lele dilatation all these can cause electrical remodeling and atrial fibrillation uh, the reverse of it that is atrial fibrillation reverse of it that is atrial fibrillation leading to uh, atrial uh, af mediated cardiomyopathy here atrial fibrillation causes alteration in af triggers and substrate that leads to atrial remodeling tachycardia and irregular rhythm along with cellular and extracellular and neurohormonal mechanisms leads to ventricular remodeling which may be reversible or irreversible that in turn leads to atrial fibrillation mediated cardiomyopathy now we know that uh, patient uh, here uh, there is both atrial fibrillation and heart failure but we how to know which came first that is whether the atrial fibrillation is leading to heart failure or heart failure is a uh, causes atrial fibrillation there are some points that can help but not ideally differentiate easily so one a patient who is known case of atrial fibrillation with no prior history of ihd or dcm and on mri if there is late, uh, late gadolinium enhancement suggestive of atrial involvement with a normal ventricular myocardium these go in favor of af mediated cardiomyopathy Whereas patients in known case of heart failure or history like IHD, status post PTCA or uh, DCM or restricted cardiomyopathy, all these can have uh, late gadolinium enhancement suggestive of ventricular scarring or suggestive of any infiltrative diseases which are more favorable of heart failure resulting in atrial fibrillation. Uh, now, coming to the point management of atrial fibrillation. Uh, why should we manage atrial fibrillation or why should we manage atrial fibrillation? This was a meta-analysis that was published in European Heart Journal in 2009 consisting of seven randomized and nine observational studies with heart failure and they identified that AF associated with heart failure had increased mortality compared to AF uh, a, with heart failure where AF was not associated with. Thus, we know that atrial fibrillation should be managed. Now, what are the options for management of atrial fibrillation? It's either rhythm or rate control. Now, which should we do? Rhythm or rate control, which always stays as a bias. Here are some trials that says here is one trial that is uh, conducted by CHF STAT therapy where they tried spontaneous conversion and maintenance of sinus rhythm by amadron in patients with heart failure and atrial fibrillation. The patients who were converted and maintained on anadrone with uh, maintained on sinus rhythm with amadron had a lower mortality as compared to patients who were left with atrial fibrillation. Whereas there is one more trial uh, which was done by atrial fibrillation and congestive heart failure investigators. Here, there was a comparison between rate control, that is beta blocker with or without decoxin versus rhythm control, amiotron, uh, which in both paroxysmal and persistent AF in cases of heart failure with reduce, reduced ejection fraction. Here, it was identified that cardiovascular survival uh, and secondary outcomes like all cause death, stroke were all similar in both the groups. Again, causing it more a dilemma. However, we all know there is something, a firm trial where it was already, uh, which was a huge trial which convert. Uh, differentiated rate versus rhythm control in all patients in this which was considered as that rate and rhythm control remain the same but this was a sub-study from the fm's trial which said that nyha functional class was significantly worse if af was present at follow-up than patients who were converted to sinus rhythm and in case of functional class six minute walk uh, test distance improved over the course of time in patients who were treated with either strategy but had modestly longer six minute walk test in rhythm control patients compared to rate control patients Although a rhythm control approach used to treat AF does not improve survival, some incremental improvement in functional status were achievable. So now coming to what are the options for rhythm control? The first option remains the medical management, uh, which is a, which is usually followed in most of the centers. Atrial fibrillation here, there are, uh, my topic con concentrates on heart failure. So with heart failure with preserved digital fraction or normal early function, the options remain IV amitron or ibutilide as class 2A recommendation and uh, class 2B for procanamide. Whereas in ejection fraction less than 40%, the only drug option remains is IV amitron. Now, uh, regarding maintenance of sinus rhythm in uh, heart failure patients, in case of preserved ejection fraction or normal LD function, dofetilide, dronedarone, uh, plicanide, propofenone all remain 2A followed by amitron. Whereas in patients with less than 40% uh, EF or any structural heart disease, amitron and dofetilide remains 2A, whereas sotalol comes to 2B. Plicanide and propofenone are contraindicated. And in case patients who are having NYHA class 3 or 4 or recent decompensated heart failure, they their even dronedarone is contraindicated. Otherwise, dronedarone AF remains class 2A recommendation. Now, our patient were treated with amiodarone infusion and other guideline-directed medical therapy with a follow-up echo that showed that rate was controlled, but ejection fraction, there was no improvement neither in the or nor in the in functional class of quality of life. So, what other option remains is catheter ablation. Uh, the, almost brief introduction was of catheter ablation was given by uh, Vashama. This is what we did with our patient where uh, we did a CT-guided cartoon mapping of the atrial fibrillation and 
carotid mapping of the atrial fibrillation and we ablated using the radio uh, radio frequency ablation method here these are the uh, red spots in here and here that says the areas of burn points or ablation and this is the video that recording uh, in a 3d setting where uh, the whole ablation procedure is recorded Here we can see the when all the orientation we tried and pulmonary vein isolation and wide area pulmonary vein isolation was done. Uh, following that, the fall uh, at the six week follow up when the echo was repeated post catheter ablation, we could see some improvement in uh, ejection fraction as well as quality of life, significant improvement in quality of life. Uh, next, what about catheter ablation? What is the evidence that catheter ablation can be done? There are various trials that compared uh, various aspects. One was McDonald et al., RK, RKHF, and uh, CAMTAF AF and camera MRI study where they uh, compared catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation versus medical therapy by rate control and AATAC trial in 2016 that compared rhythm control with amiodarone and a Kessel AF trial which uh, I look for quality, improvement in quality of life, mortality and recurrence of AF in, uh, by catheter ablation. All these studies, meta-analysis done say that all-cause mortality, heart failure, hospitalization and patients who remained with atrial fibrillation uh, were Compare, uh, compared where it was suggested that catheter ablation was favorable compared to medical therapy. Uh, coming to the next, uh, this thing where LV ejection fraction, six minute walk distance and quality of life was compared again saying that catheter ablation was favorable compared to medical therapy. Uh, this was published as a research paper by uh, catheter ablation compared with medical therapy for atrial fibrillation with heart failure by Kuo Li Pan in the Indian Journal of Medical Sciences in 2021. Next, one more method that was discussed was cryoablation, which proved safety and efficacy in HEPREP, significantly improving NYHA class and LVF and decreased age, uh, AF recurrence. Next, the recent trial that published was Kessel HTX trial. Here, what they did was patients who were subjected or referred for catheter ablation, they were compared with uh, two groups. One is ablation plus medical therapy and the other being only medical therapy. Here, they identified that patients who underwent catheter ablation with medic, uh, and guideline-directed medical therapy had better outcomes and prevention of heart, heart transplantation or LVSS device implantation as compared to those who are treated with medical therapy alone. Uh, these are the two ongoing trials, that is contra-HF trial where triablation versus pharmacological therapy in patients with AF and HF and RACE-8HF trial where triablation versus standard medical care in patients with paroxysmal and persistent AF with EF less than 40 are uh, being studied. We, till now, we more like mainly concentrated on heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Right now, let us go to a topic where heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. This is overall a different entity where we saw that in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, prevalence of atrial fibrillation amounts to 30 to 60 percent. And in patients with AF, 21 percent of patients will have HEFPEP. In HEFPEP, the presence of AF is associated with increased mortality, thrombolytic risk, and hospitalization rates for heart failure. Now, what is this pathophysiology of uh, AF? in HEFPEP, that is in atrial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation leads to reduced uh, peak oxygen consumption, increased anti-proBNP, increased dilatation. This leads to HEFPEP and also AF on its own along with HEFPEP causes increased hospitalization and increased mortality. By treating this using uh, catheter ablation, uh, we, we have seen that the peak uveitic consumption increases, reduction in inlet dilatation, reduction in hospitalization and reduction in mortality is noted. This was one of the sub-study from Cabana, Cabana trial, which who took symptomatic atrial fibrillation and compared for significant improvement in quality of life. They found that patient who underwent catheter ablation had a better symptom uh, improvement in quality of life at 12 months compared to those with drug therapy. There's one more trial which was uh, published by Tomoko et al. Efficacy, safety and outcomes of catheter ablation in HEPA. Here we identified that AF can be effectively and safely treated with a composite of repeat procedures and pharmaceuticals in patients with HEPA. But however, rates of arrhythmia recurrence and need for multiple drugs persisted. One more trial was AF ablation in HEFF. AF ablation improved invasive exercising homodynamic parameters, exercise capacity and quality of life in patients with concomitant AF and HEFF. 
this is a meta analysis where they compared hefpref and hefpref because the hefpref we already know that there is uh, evidence to say that cathode tabulation is favorable so they compared hefpref versus hefpref for cathode tabulation uh, meta analysis said that beat hefpref beat hefpref it stands the same that is all cause mortality risk of recurrence and hospitalizations all remain the same beat hefpref or hefpref and there was one more trial which was rack tf trial where they com compared catheter based ablation for rhythm control versus rate control where they said that there was no much statistical difference in all cause mortality or heart failure events uh, thinking it why there is one more trial that brought in the answer for this that the lifestyle modifications for treatment of atrial fibrillation here they studied the fourth pillar the we know the three pillars of atrial fibrillation management that is anticoagulation rate control and rhythm control here the concentrate on the fourth pillar that is the risk factor management the obesity, sleep apnea, hyperlipidemia, smoking, alcohol, physical inactivity, genetics, aortic stiffness, all are associated with development of AF. And patients with AF who compressively managed their risk factors demonstrated a greater reduction in symptoms, AF burden, and more successful aberrations, and improved clinical outcomes, and with greater AF freedom than those with whose lifestyle modifications or risk factor management was not effective. Probably this substantiates why the RAFT AF trial turned out to be sort of a negative trial. Now, we saw that heart failure and ejection for uh, atrial fibrillation has varium, variable management and drugs remain the class 2A recommendation, class 1 for catheter ablation. So, should all patients with AF undergo ablation? Here comes that point where we said that uh, heart failure can lead to AFib. So, management of heart failure with AFib, the first remain always the guideline directed medical treatment for heart failure. What is the guideline director of medical therapy? We all know there are the four pillars of heart failure management, RNA, A's, ARV, beta blockers, MRAs, and SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, why this come into play is that there was a meta-analysis that is that said compared patients in heart failure treated with ACE inhibitors and ARVs and those who are not treated. It identified that patients who were treated with ACE ARV had a better outcome and lesser chances, lesser recurrence, or lesser occurrence of atrial fibrillation as compared to patients who are not treated. This is a trial that was published in, uh, in Journal of JSCC in 2005, which said that prevention of atrial fibrillation was possible with treat patients on heart failure treated with angiotensin conservative in enzyme inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Now we have uh, known this. The next point is who should undergo ablation. So patients who benefit from catheter ablation are those possibly a where AF-mediated cardiomyopathy can be suspected or earlier stages of heart failure. Uh, no significant ventricular scarring on the cardiac MRI, no or mild atrial fibrillase, uh, fibrosis, paroxysmal or early persistent atrial fibrillation, younger patients without significant or other comorbidities. Here again, we can say that patients who have reduced ejection fraction of EF less than 40, AF catheter, AF catheter ablation remains class 1 recommendation, whereas heart failure with preserved ejection fraction that is less than more than 50, AF catheter ablation remains class 2A recommendation. In cases of recurrent atrial fibrillation, a repeated ablation can be tried or can be go ahead with pharmacological management. Coming to those people who are less likely to less likely to benefit from catheter ablation are those with advanced heart failure, significant ventricular scar on cardiac MRI, or severe atrial myopathy with dilatation of fibrosis, long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, prior failed ablations, or advanced age or multiple comorbidities. Here, pharmacological rhythm therapy versus rate control strategy comes into play. Rate control strategy will be spoken by the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Suhas, for that uh, wonderful insight into managing atrial fibrillation and heart failure. Before we move on to the next talk, there are some burning questions. I would probably uh, request our moderators to address them. Dr. Shreyas asks, what should be the drug of choice for a patient presenting first time with atrial fibrillation and fast ventricular rate and shock? and we do not know the state of clot, should we go ahead with DC cardioversion or amiodron? Dr. Venkat? So the, <laughs> the very good question. So the patients presenting with the cardiogenic shock. So if the patient's presenting with cardiogenic shock, I think if you are suspecting, uh, um, you know, sometimes this is a very tricky thing. I'll tell you why the tricky thing. If the ejection fraction is very low, Sometimes the rate, if you suddenly change the rate, they actually, in fact, the heart failure may even get worse. That's another thing, which is a possibility. Um, so uh, cardioverting, you have to be extremely careful when you cardiovert the patient, which may not cardiovert, you know, because the filling pressures are so high. 
um, without having a background of uh, some form of an anti-rhythmic drug therapy. Uh, in that situation, uh, you know, I think treating the heart failure as such is the good way to start. If the patient is very rapidly, um, you know, um, uh, you know, going with atrial fibrillation and you don't have any other reason why this patient is having a heart failure, then I think you have to uh, adapt to, it's almost, you consider almost like an hemodynamically unstable type of a patient. In that case, I think cardioversion and possibly using an amiodron as a choice would be the first try. Now, having said that, is the drug like dofetilide or other things can be utilized. Um, in, in um, I think you know that the Diamond HF trial was the only drug with by the trial that was used in uh, where uh, the ejection fraction, lower ejection fraction patients were uh, tested. These are the only two drugs, dofetilide and the um, amiodrone are the only two drugs which you could use because sotolol has got a high mortality risk in patients with lower than 25% ejection fraction. That was used more on the chronic heart failure type of patients. In acute cardiogenic shock issues, I think uh, the strategy has to be carefully adapted with respect to whether the rate control, sudden change in the rate, could, could it make patients worse? That's the, you need to keep that in mind. But if uh, purely, I think they present, because of the uh, tachycardia-associated heart failure or cardiogenic shock, in that case, I think first thing to do is to make sure that we get them out of the atrial fibrillation if feasible. Dr. Prakash, you're muted. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, this is another question by Dr. Shreyas. I would probably ask uh, Dr. Satish to give an answer. Can we use amiotron in RHD with severe MS and atrial fibrillation, past ventricular rate, and electron? But rate is not controlled by beta blockers or calcium antagonists. And if LA is dilated, considering patients won't develop, I mean, won't be able to convert to rhythm control as the LA is dilated. Sir, if, if the patient is having a severe MS, the underlying hemodynamics, that is mitosis, should be uh, taken care, either in the form of opening or uh, doing a surgery. But we see quite often a lot of patients with uh, rheumatic atrial fibrillation. It's difficult to control the ventricular rate in spite of using beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and digoxin. In those subset of patients, we use amiodrone, not for rhythm control, for controlling the ventricular rate. And chances of these patients coming back to coming back to sinus rhythm is very less considering the underlying LS car and the substrate. Dr. Satish, I think that craft trial done by Dr. Amitwara and group clearly said that amiodron probably is a good drug to be used in the background of rheumatic heart disease. But I think your message is very clear. Unless you treat the severe MS, you may not be able to adequately control uh, atrial fibrillation in this subset of patients. Thank you. Thanks, Satan. Uh, we'll go on to the next uh, part of the uh, CME. This is on uh, rate control management in patients with where all of the things have failed and we have so-called permanent atrial fibrillation. How do we manage these patients? Over to... Uh, yeah, you're there. Sorry. Please go on, uh, Dr. Pavitra. Thank you, sir. Uh, before before you jump in, can I make one comment? Please, uh, please, 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 Doctor. Yeah. So, and I think uh, we, there is a big credit that we have to give to Doctor Sanjay Saxena. I think probably that's one of the important things when it because the the HFF population. This is I know that the HFF is probably less of a concern at this point of time in India as opposed to what we are seeing here, because more than fifty percent of our hospital hospitalization okay. due to heart failure is due to HFF. It has changed a lot in the last 20 years. And uh, partly because aging population, most of our patients are 80 plus. So it's uh, very common and 90 plus are coming as well. So it's uh, getting uh, to a point, I think we are dealing with completely different subject. Now the Sarceras uh, uh, work was very good actually in HFF population is been less credited. In fact, I think probably in the future will needs to be addressed. Is uh, when he actually did atrial fibrillation ablation in these patients with HFF. But the problem is the recurrence rate is very high, as you know. So what he did was, was biatrial pacing. So the concept of biatrial pacing, what he did was 
He placed in the coronary sinusostium in the muscular portion and as well as the RA. When you did that, you reduced the dispersion between the RA and LA. When you do that, the chance of recurrence of atrial fibrillation diminished substantially. So in that way, I think these patients did very well. You can keep them out of the hospital very nicely. But somehow that's not taken off, uh, isn't it, Dr. Venkat? Because I also tried I know. patients <laughs> with dismal results and then gave up yes. halfway. Yes. But it's a good yeah, concept. I, know. I think it, yeah, it's a good concept. But theatral dispersion is a huge issue. I think we see that all, all the time. There is an interatrial block all the time uh, in, in this group of patients that... Uh, you are, you are dependent on early filling of the ventricle in uh, diastolic heart failure if you are already delayed. And I have seen coronary sinus uh, catheters showing atrial activity at the same time, almost like a left sided pacemaker syndrome in this group of patients. So yeah, I think we need to do something about it in order to make them better. I think it's a question of time when the trials come in. So, And the typical problem is again with HCM patients in atrial fibrillation. That's another Absolutely. difficult uh, group of population that you find it difficult to manage. Thank you. Thank you for Perfect. your insight, Perfect. Dr. Venkat. Dr. Pavita, please. Yes, sir. So, good morning, one and all. So today we'll be discussing how to control the rate in the permanent atrial fibrillation. This is a very common problem what we're facing today. So first we'll look at what is exactly the permanent atrial fibrillation. The new guidelines which has been published in recently November 30th, 2023, according to that, the term permanent atrial fibrillation is used when the patient and the clinician makes a joint decision in order to maintain the sinus rhythm. So acceptance of atrial fibrillation, it represents a therapeutic decision and it doesn't represent an inherent pathophysiological attribute of the atrial fibrillation. So it's a mutual decision which has been taken to restore the sinus rhythm. So, how to control the rate acute and the chronic? So, first we'll be discussing the acute rate control. So, this is a guidance which is taken from ACC 2023. And uh, here, if the patient is hemodynamic AF, atrial fibrillation is a rapid ventricular response and the patient is hemodynamically stable. So, the class 1 indication will be the beta blockers and the non dihydropin calcium channel blockers, provided the ejection fraction is good, like more than LVF of more than 40%. And next, the class 2A indication for this is the digoxin and class 2B will be the amiodarone. And if the patient is hemodynamically not stable, unstable patient with AF with far rapid ventricular response, then the direct cardioversion is a class 1 indication. So this is the various list of the drugs where we are using routinely. The beta blockers is the first drug of choice and non dihydropyrin calcium channel blockers, dildiazam and verapamil and the digoxin and the amiodarone. So, the long-term rate control, provided that the AF is good. If the AF is good, like more than 40%, the beta blockers and non, non dihydropin calcium channel blockers are the class 1 indication and the class 2 is the digoxin. And if the AF is less, like less than 40%, the beta blockers is the class 1 indication and the digoxin is the class 2A. So, these are the various rate control trials. There's an AFIM trial, which is well known to us, and the STAFF trial and the RACE trial where they compared the rhythm control versus the rate control in the case in the permanent atrial fibrillation. So the overall inference is the rhythm control did not offer any advantage over the rate control. So again, this is the various trials, PF trial and RACE trial and the digoxin trial. So even the, here also, in the, they compared the rhythm versus the rate control. And even the digoxin trial, which is a huge trial with the digoxin did not reduce the overall mortality, but it just decreased the rate of hospitalization. So overall, the impression was the rate control, uh, rhythm uh, control versus the rate control, it was not much beneficial. So here, I would like to uh, uh, tell about the case study, which in our hospital we deal. So here's a 60-year male patient who presented with fatigue and exertional breathlessness for past two months. The patient was diagnosed elsewhere as atrial fibrillation with a fast ventricular rate, and the patient was started as per the guideline-directed medical management. So, and he presented to our, our, our hospital uh, with worsening of the symptoms in the past two weeks. And this was the ECG of the patient, where the patient ECG was suggestive of atrial fibrillation with a fast ventricular response. And this is the echo of the patient where there's a dilated left atrium, decreased uh, LV function. So, we started the patient on as per the guideline directed management with the various beta, with the beta blockers and the non dihydropyrin calcium channel blockers was used and still the rate was not controlled. And next, what to do is a question, whether even in spite of all the antiarrhythmic medications, the rate was not under the control. So this says that there's a limitation of the drugs, antiarrhythmic drugs, which are using in the patients with early rejection fraction. 
and the rate was still not controlled. So next question is what to do to control the rate. So I would like to express a few cautions regarding this. That is rhythm control versus the rate control via the anti drugs versus the rate control, which is better. And the limited options we have for using the anti drugs in the patients with uh, heart failure and even the drugs which has a pro effects in the structural heart disease, including the heart failure and widely and locally available, which we use routinely is the amiodarol. So next option is how to control the rate in the patients. So I would like to tell what we did in the patient, in this same patient. So we come, here's a study where I would like to bring about that law, what is the effect of ablation versus the drug therapy. So here is a Mayo Clinic in 1970 to 1990, where they compared the long-term survival in the patients who was underwent the avionodal ablation and the drug therapy. So when we look at the law, after the avionodal ablation and the pacing, so we looked at the long-term survival in the study. There was significant, there was not much uh, significant uh, difference between ablation and drug therapy, but the long-term outcome or the survival was better and there was no uh, adverse effects with the ablation. In this study, they compared the with the structural heart disease and the uh, coronary heart disease and the congestive heart failure. So where they found that the long-term adverse effects was not there with the ablation versus the drug therapy and the survival was better. So here I would like to tell about the aircraft. There's an Australian intervention trial, which was uh, published in 2003. So here they come, they took 99 patients at five different centers and they ablated the AV node in the patients with the heart failure of NYHA class two to class three. And they come, they looked at the outcome. So after doing the AV node ablation in the symptomatic permanent atrial fibrillation with NYHA two to three, they did not, uh, they improved the LV function and the quality of life and in the long term. So this is a meta-analysis where they compared the um, avionodal ablation in the permanent atrial fibrillation versus the RV pacing. So the five randomized trials was taken, total of eight and patients. So they found that uh, avionodal ablation with the pacing was better rather than the RV lead pacing. So this is a meta-analysis in June 2022 where they compared the post-operative outcomes. So 93 studies were taken with 11,340 patients where they have compared the RV pacing versus the biventricular pacing, the CRT. So AV nodal ablation has been considered as a valid approach in a, high, in a symptomatic atrial fibrillation which who are intolerant to the uh, treatment, drug treatment. So the better outcome was seen with the CRT compared to the uh, RV lead. So this is a meta-analysis where 29 authors were taken into consideration in June to July 2018. So they uh, looked at the outcome, long-term improvement or outcomes of the avionodal ablation. So when they looked at all the studies, they found that there was significant uh, improvement in the LV function, their uh, cardiac performance, their symptoms-free period and exercise tolerance and even the quality of life. And there was uh, uh, less uh, procedural mortality and the morbidity. So the avionodal ablation and the permanent pacemaker found to be better. So this is a this is a study which to show that what is the adverse effects of ventricular pacing in heart failure. This tells about the ill effects of the RV pacing. So when the percentage ventricular percentage of left, less than forty percent is a dotted line, and uh, the ventricular percent sorry ventricular percentage of less than forty percent is a straight line, which is that, and the dotted line is the uh, ventricular percentage of more than forty percent. So the, the there was a ventricular percentage of less than forty percent. The long term uh, event free survival period was better. So now comes the APAF CRT modulated trial where the come it was published in ESE 2021 where they randomized around 133 patients for the ablation and the CRT and the uh, some uh, rest patients for the drugs. So in this study where the outcome was like ablation, ivinodal ablation and CRT was superior to the pharmacological therapy in improving the um, outcome of the patients with a narrow KRS irrespective of their baseline, whether it was reduced rejection fraction or with the normal rejection fraction. So this was found to be better with APAF CRT mortality trial. So based on all this, in our patient, what we did? So here is a his bundle lead, which we have placed at the his bundle. And this is the LBBB, LBBB area was mapped and just distilled to 15 to 20 centimeters, just distilled to it, LBBB area was mapped and we got, we obtained a uh, LBBB morphology. And uh, this was, uh, we obtained a his potential and then the LBV area was mapped and we play, we uh, place the LBV lead. And this is the morphology which we got. There's a, a W pattern in the V1 and the discordance in the AVR and the AVL. 
And this is the final morphology of WO, uh, WO pattern which you obtained in the V1. And the patient symptom symptomatically improved and patient still under the follow-up to us. This is the final placement of the lead, of the LBB lead. So here is a trial. What I want to conclude is, see, left bundle branch area pacing uh, was done in the 25 uh, patients where the pace and ablate strategy, which was done in 2021 to 2022, July to November. So here, they performed the left bundle branch area pacing uh, combined with AV nodal ablation in a single procedure in elderly patients with symptomatic AF. And this was found to be feasible and safe. In our patient, we did the LBB area was mapped and the same sitting, the AV nodal ablation was done. And uh, it was an elderly patient too. And the symptoms also improved. And even the LV function, the LV performance was also better. And patient was symptom free. And the new guidelines, which has come recently, number, number 38 in ACCHA 2023, which showed that the class one uh, indications is in the patients with AF who are planned for avionodal ablation. So implantation of the pacemaker before the ablation, either you do it before or the same day of ablation. This is a recommendation in order to ensure the adequacy of the leads before performing the ablation. And class 2A remains the same. There's an AF with uncon rapid ventricular response was refracted to the uh, drug management. The AV nodal ablation is useful to improve the symptoms and the quality of life. And you, uh, we set the pacemaker at the higher rate of 80 to 90 beats per minute in the patients with um, AV nodal ablation in order to reduce the sudden cardiac death. So which patient to pace and ablate? So we discussed from all the previous uh, uh, speakers. So PV isolation of the pulmonary veins. So this is uh, for whom it is better for younger patients who's, who has a severe symptoms, who has a reduced ejection fraction and tachycardia induced uh, cardiomyopathy. So the benefits of these patients is there is improvement in the mortality, morbidity and the symptoms and the quality of life and there's improvement in the LV function. So which we discussed, which is proved by the CASL AF and RAFT AF trials. But the only uh, disadvantage is you have a procedure related complications like flatter recurrence and all. So AV junction, AV nodal ablation and the CRT pacing, which usually we discuss elderly patients who has a various uh, EFA, like a reduced ejection fraction or mid-range or preserved and irrespective of the QRS durations. So the rate control is better and the patient had the improvement in the mortality, morbidity and quality of life and even the LV function. So, which is proved in the case of APAF CRT model literature. Only the disadvantage is the patient will become the pacemaker dependency. And now coming to the rate control, like routinely which use beta blockers, decoxins, and this. So, usually we try it in all the uh, uh, LV functions like re reduced or mid range or preserved. So, only thing is uh, the inability to achieve the rate control and the adverse effects of the drug, the proarrhythmic effects and the uh, adverse effects of the drug like bradycardia and the hypotension. So this will tell that the once the patient is in inadequate rate control in the other modalities like AV nodal ablation and the pace, permanent pacemaker will come into the role. And which patient to consider in elderly patients with the persistent atrial fibrillations and the heart failure and patient who has a com multiple comorbidities and patients who has a dilatory left atrium and the mechanical mitral valve and patients who are intolerant to the drugs. So these are the patients where the avionodal pacing should uh, ablation and the pacing should be considered. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pravitra, for that uh, insight into dealing with patients with a permanent atrial fibrillation. I think needless to say that we know are we pacing more than 40 and probably even 20% will lead to progressive LV dysfunction and somebody is already having impaired LV function, that's not the way to go. So very clearly, I think a CRT or a bundle conduction system pacing would be the way out once you ablate the AV node in patients who are not responding to drugs. And probably that may be a better way to look at dealing these with these patients. And Dr. Venkat, when he said, clearly the RR interval uh, is very important. So if you regularize the RR interval with pacing, I think these patients will do better compared to patients who have atrial fibrillation, drug controlled rate, uh, limit, a controlled rate. But despite the RR intervals being irregular, I think will still not reverse the LV function unless you have a regularization of the RR interval. Thanks for that. One question before we move on to the uh, mm -hmm. next part of the talk pill in the pocket approach for atrial fibrillation. Could I have the insights from both the moderators? This has been a question. 
Um, I can take this one. Uh, we uh, we have used uh, this strategy in a selected population. Uh, one thing you need to absolutely make sure we are uh, using uh, a patient who has completely no structural heart disease. That's probably one of the best ways to look at it. So that means most of the drugs which can be used as a pill in the uh, pocket strategy are uh, the symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation where uh, you know they know exactly where the situation is and they, there's no question of anticoagulation they are taking and you are using predominantly to convert. That means they have to be very healthy patients. Um, despite the um, concept of using fit in the pocket strategy at home to convert these rhythms, you know that they were originally when the trial was done and published, uh, it was actually initiated in the hospital. So the first, uh, very first dose needs to be initiated in the hospital. These are the class three Class 1C antiarrhythmic drugs needs to be initiated in the hospital as a first time, first term, first time uh, use. Subsequently, you can use them. But uh, one important thing to keep that in mind, even if you use the strategy, is uh, never forget they will never develop coronary artery disease, never develop uh, uh, problems in the future. You need to have a surveillance as you are following in the, uh, you know, in the clinic. So those are the situations I think you can use them um, to treat predominantly uh, the symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Venkat. Uh, one more question by Dr. Nitin. Uh, Dr. A a acute AF in acute myocardial infarction, whether we need long-term anticoagulation and do we go by the CHAGVAS score? Dr. Satish? So it depends upon the underlying LV pumping function and also on the CHAGVAS score. So it requires, we start off with anticoagulation and re-evaluation after a, a few months and look how is EF has improved and look at chart fast score. If chart fast score is low and EF has improved, I think we can go slow on anticoagulation. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, another interesting question by Dr. Shreyas. How long should we continue anticoagulation patient with atrial fibrillation after rhythm control and why? It, it once again depends upon the chart fast score, whether it's anti mix or ablation, these are not uh, foolproof procedures. Still, they can have a recurrence of uh, atrial fibrillation. If chart fast score is high, it's better to continue with uh, oral anticoagulation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Satish, for that. Uh, one more question before we move on to the next session. Uh, Dipankar uh, Mukyo Padhyay has a quote to make. Eva Pradin, though it's action on the AV node, it does act on the AV node partially, may have an additional rate control. Your comments, Dr. Venkat? Um, very good question. I think uh, recently the, this has been thought to be purely the IF currents in the sinus node, and now they're looking into uh, terms of uh, other trigger. Uh, there is, I think the literature is very, very small with respect to what it could potentially use for a, a rate control strategy. Uh, if there are some triggers, multiple triggers which are responsible, I think you may, it may indirectly control. Not entirely sure the AV node is the primary target by the Ivabredin. It's uh, probably the multiple uh, triggers in the atria itself. So that's what I think it is. Uh, we don't have too much literature at this point of time. Having said that, I want to make one more comment. In uh, persistent atrial fibrillation, uh, permanent atrial fibrillation, we, as we discussed in the previous talk, excellent talk. It's very difficult to talk about a rate control strategy in the current context because uh, everybody is moving towards the rhythm control and uh, who are these patients left out in uh, rate control uh, are the ones which are very difficult. Um, as that, That's why the guidelines, was, they were very, very careful how they actually could word it. Um, the, we, I have seen this uh, time and again. And uh, just to give you one very beautiful example is a patient that I did a performed atrial fibrillation ablation back in 2010, I believe. And uh, subsequently, he did well. He had a tachy induced cardiomyopathy at the time, recovered, EF recovered, year later, atrial fibrillation recurred, recurred, and he went for a second ablation. Then ablation was done. He did well for another year. Then it, once again, it recurred. Then I decided, I think it's the best idea to do a rate control strategy, but the VF never really dropped. Then he showed up uh, to me like a eight uh, last uh, in 2019. 
with, uh, uh, you know, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction with a rapid atrial fibrillation. It's not anymore reduced ejection fraction at this time. And he's now 83 years old. And I asked him, well, you know, if we already did all these things, I think it's a good idea. Maybe we just do consider doing, uh, you know, yeah, that bundle area pacing and possibly consider doing this. Then he said, well, you know, the technology must be different now compared to what it used to be. How about giving one more try on AFib ablation? The patient himself asked me. He said, I was very skeptical. And the only difference compared to what I was used to do was the concept I think we really didn't touch, touch upon was the vein of martial alcohol and all those things. And uh, we went after all those things and he did actually organize his rhythm went into normal sinus rhythm, converted. And it's been four years back in sinus rhythm. The reason why I want to bring up the concept of permanent atrial fibrillation is the labeling. I think we kind of very poorly understand who is really carried up atria. And we know that Andrew, Mar I mean, Marusha's, Nazim Marusha's data is not reproducible by many people because MRI is not very good in actually identifying the scar. That's the biggest problem I think we have. Um, and um, I think we have to really look at the, how much remodeling has really happened. In the absence of significant LA dilatation, I think uh, we need to reconsider making sure we're absolutely sure this choice what we are using because patients may or may not know if the patient is is willing to try in a different you know, another ablation, then in that case, I think we have to carefully consider looking into this aspect as well. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank one thing you. what uh, I want to bring up is earlier, I think AUJ ablation and pacing used to come as a last resort. Because pacing, as we know, pacing, we are worried about pacing induced uh, cardiac, but even though management is easier, but it present with conduction system pacing, I think uh, with AVJ ablation pacing may get some pace. True, 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 Dr. Satish. One thing I think what was really interesting to note, uh, as Dr. Venkat said, their group, their set of population in the US are very enthusiastic about procedures. They don't mind the second or the third. Uh, Procedure. Imagine that in our uh, country, Dr. Satish. One procedure itself is so very, uh, you know, distressing to them. Where's the question of repeat procedures? Mm -hmm. See, that's the problem. Why if ablation has not taken off in this country? There are very few operators, and the problem is the, the request from the patient. They are not willing to go in for the second procedure. That's why, you know, many of them, I, in fact, I'm telling you, my number of A procedures have really plummeted. The way I used to do aggressively 10 years back, I hardly take up now because I know there's always some atrial tachyarrhythmia coming back and they're not willing for another procedure. Uh, that's the limitation that we have in this country and cost also is another issue. So I think we know we are... Uh, whereas US, it's just taken off like anything. They are doing this uh, pulse field and all that, which is something... Uh, something really to look forward. I to. think with single shot technology, pulse field ablation with the uh, become procedure becomes simpler. India also may take up. So uh, mainly re reimbursement is the issue. Insurance and uh... absolutely. One question is uh, on sacrobacterial valsartan by Dr. Sam Stephenson. Whether it's useful in AFib with heart failure? Yeah, I think definitely because heart failure. We have seen all the sub studies uh, with uh, the Paradigm HF and even the DAPA HF and all those. Sub studies where they found with use of these uh, anti failure, these pillars, obviously there's a reduction in the incidence of atrial fibrillation in all these subset of patients with heart failure. So I think they work. They work for heart failure and they'll definitely reduce the burden of uh, atrial fibrillation in the subset of patients. So I think without, uh, I think probably we'll have to move on, switch gears, and then go on to the next part of the talk. Uh, this is on when we know patient has a high bleeding risk, how do we manage these patients with atrial fibrillation and risk of stroke? So I invite uh, Dr. Krishna uh, yes, for yes. talk. So good morning all, uh, Krishna here. I'll be discussing about the role of left atrial appendage closure in patients with AF with a high bleeding risk. So coming to why left atrial appendage, uh, because 92% of the left atrial thrombi are localized in the left atrial appendage. 60% of 
atrial thrombi in valvular AF and more than 90% of atrial thrombi in non-valvular AF patients are located in the left atrial appendage. So what are the different morphologies and the most common one? Most common morphology of left atrial appendage being chicken wing appearance followed by cauliflower, pinsock and cactus. So coming to a case study, an 81-year-old male who is a diabetic hypertensive who presented with bruising on various parts of his body and a history of head injury despite being on adequate dose of anticoagulation and INR-adjusted dose. So in this patient, uh, we have to take a call regarding what next to be done to prevent such history of falls and head injury. So what are the potential indications of left atrial appendage occlusion in patients with F? Primarily being a high bleeding risk and a high risk of stroke. Secondary being a failed oral anticoagulant therapy or a severe bleeding occurring during oral anticoagulant or an alternative to oral anticoagulants in patients with high bleeding risk on top of oral anticoagulant to further decrease the risk of stroke recurrence. So the devices available as of now are Watchman, Plateau, uh, Amulet and the most common being the Watchman device. And coming, so there is also a surgical device which is surgical uh, lariat or atriclip. So coming to our case, we had done a screening TEE which showed a dilated left atrium and left atrial appendage uh, orifice mentioning to, uh, uh, measuring 21 mm. EF was normal and this is the echo of the patient showing an enlarged left atrium with a left atrial appendage. So uh, uh, we went ahead with the CT cardiac angio which showed a dilated left atrium and a LAA with an orifice of 21 into 19 mm, LVH and normal pulmonary venous drainage. So this is the cardiac CT as we can see here showing a uh, cauliflower uh, type left atrial appendage. So we went ahead with a watchman device closure. As you can see, you have done a transeptal puncture uh, through the posterior inferior uh, approach under TEE guidance. And then we have introduced the watchman delivery device system. Following which we had introduced a five inch pigtail and done a left atrial angio following a left atrial appendage angio, confirming the uh, position of the left atrial appendage and the watchman device was deployed. 24 mm watchman device was deployed. And as you can see, these are the uh, fluoroscopies showing the deployment of the watchman device. Post deployment of the device, the device was noted in good position, which no with no post deployment leak. This was the fluoroscopy done one day later, which showed a good device position and no post device leak. So coming to the complications of this procedure, the complications may include a problem with the device itself, probably a sizing, a reaction to anesthesia, bleeding, chest pain, cardiac arrest, arrhythmias and infection and pericardial effusion. So coming to the trials, the devices versus the drugs. The first trial is the PROTECT AF trial. It was a randomized control trial done between left appendage uh, occlusion with uh, watchmen or warfarin. So in this, it has shown that the device showed a lesser risk of having stroke, systemic embolization and death as a primary endpoint. And also the mortality was low in patients who had underwent a watchman device occlusion. And these are, this is an overview of the trial. As we can see, the hemorrhagic stroke, ischemic stroke mortality was much more in the warfarin device, warf warfarin group rather than the device group. So next is the uh, prevail trial, which was also done between watchmen and warfarin to know the complications of left atrial appendage occlusion with watchmen. And it showed complication was 2.2% in the pericardial effusion being the most common which was 0.4% and uh, few patients required pericardiosynthesis. Now, most of the trials as we discussed was between warfarin versus watchmen. PROC-17 discussed NOAC versus watchmen and NOAC versus watchmen, which was a PROC-17 trial, showed that left atrial appendage occlusion was non-inferior to NOAC at preventing net ischemic bleeding events. And in fact, the uh, risk of bleeding was much lesser in patients who had underwent, underwent a watchman device closure compared to a NOAC. The NOAC which was used here was a Pixabal. Now coming to the newest device, which is the Watchman FLX device. It was approved in 2020 and of the 3 lakh Watchman devices done till now, 1,90,000 of these device closures was done with this device, Watchman FLX. So the Pinnacle FLX trial has evaluated the outcome of Watchman FLX device trial in patients with non-valular AFib 
and it was done in 29 centers and the secondary efficacy endpoint of two year ischemic stroke or systemic embolization was met with a rate of 3.4%, 9.3% all cause mortality, 5.5% cardiovascular death, 3.4% all stroke, 10.1% major bleeding. So Watchman device demonstrated a favorable safety and efficacy outcomes. Now, why was this favorable? Because this Watchman FLX device, the newest device, which reduced the pericardial effusion, improved the left atrial appendage ceiling and enhanced the device stability. And the rate of complete anatomic left atrial appendage closure with this device was 90% and all residual leaks were less than 3 mm at one year follow-up. More than 7 mm being a significant, but this device had a less than 3 mm residual leak after one year follow-up. Coming to the Champion AF clinical trial, this is a trial which was which is ongoing, which was which is Watchman FLX device versus NOAC. It is ongoing in 3,000 patients across 150 global sites. And the primary endpoints which this trial wants to meet is Watchman FLX should be non-inferior for occurrence of stroke and systemic embolism at 36 months, superior for non-procedural bleeding at 36 months, and non-inferior to occurrence of stroke and systemic embolization at 60 months. This is an ongoing trial. And coming to guidelines, what's new? The uh, ACC AHA guidelines for a left atrial appendage closure showed that in patients with in whom long-term anticoagulation is contraindicated, which has severe bleeding due to non-reversible cause involving GI, pulmonary, or genitourinary urinary systems, spontaneous intracranial and intraspinal bleeding due to non-reversible cause, and serious bleeding related to recurrent falls. In these patients, the long-term anticoagulation is contraindicated. And so the percutaneous left atrial appendage closure has been indicated as a 2A in patients with AF with moderate to high risk of CHADVAS and a contraindication, long-term oral anticoagulation due to non-reversible cause. Percutaneous LA appendage closure is reversible. And in 2B, in patients with AF with moderate to high risk of stroke and a high risk of major bleeding on oral anticoagulation, left atrial appendage occlusion is a reasonable alternative to anticoagulation based on a patient preference and the procedural risk syndrome. Now, coming to the surgical left atrial appendage closure in patients with AF undergoing a cardiac surgery with a CHAD mask of more than 2, uh, then a surgical LAA occlusion is indicated uh, in addition to continued coagulation, anticoagulation to reduce the risk of stroke and systemic embolism. Now, what does European guidelines say? So, the EHRA EAPCI expert consensus statement in 2020 showed that if a patient is suitable for oral anticoagulation, oral anticoagulations can be continued if there is elevated bleeding risk, such as has bled of more than three or thrombocytopenia or need for prolonged anticoagulation, uh, repeated to triple therapy, severe CAD press stenting, as in our patient who had CABG with an AFib and renal failure as a contraindication to NOAC, then we can go for left atrial appendage occlusion. Or, or patients are unwilling or unable to take oral anticoagulants, or if there is a contraindication to the oral anticoagulants, left atrial appendage occlusion may be considered. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krishna, for that uh, talk. I would now invite uh, moderators to give in their uh, valued opinion about uh, uh, left atrial left appendage closure. Dr. Vekata has a lot of insights. He's done quite a few lariats and all that. So let's hear him out and then uh, Dr. Satish after that. Uh, thank you so much once again. Uh, excellent presentation. This is uh, a topic I think uh, uh, we've been uh, have been involved in uh, the Frankfurt and uh, you know uh, the uh, HR a few times. Yeah, so the uh, if, if there are a couple of things we need to keep this in mind. The uh, the original trials for all non inferior trials. Uh, the whole idea is to say, well, is there an alternative method of actually uh, preventing strokes among these group of patients, mainly because of the fact that the original surgical literature coming all the way back to 1947, talking about the uh, location of these thrombus in the uh, left atrial appendage is the main reason. But it is not, this is on obviously non valvular related population. When it comes to valvular related population, we don't have an answer at this moment. moment. Um, when it comes to uh, the thrombus, uh, you know, the management of these patients, I think it's equally important to think, well, you know, can we 
you know, implant a left atrial appendage closure device, or we use these other techniques like called the lariat, where you exclude from the epicardial surface, whether it's the atrial clip, atrial cure clip, or the um, left atrial appendage closure uh, with the lariat. There's a little bit difference between the endocardial versus the epicardial uh, procedure. Uh, the endocardial procedure, particularly, is, it may be easier to do it, but the biggest challenge that we encounter is the device-related thrombus. We need to keep that in mind. I mean, it is not like, you know, we have we're done with the procedure. Six months after that, they're going on a single antiplatelet therapy, and they are safe, and there is no reason, even in the absence of, uh, you know, the leak. Um, sometimes, you know, we have seen the uh, uh, the answer when you implant the device, there is no leak. Leaks actually show up six months later. That, that is one thing we need to keep that in mind. Then sometimes we have seen DRTs after a year. In fact, there is a big uh, uh, study, the DRT study actually, that Simard, I think, is the first author and uh, uh, Ho Stewart was one of the major authors in this one, published in Jack, I think, two years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, where they actually looked at the stratif stratified risk, which patients tend to develop uh, device-related thrombus. And, uh, you know, they identified hypercoagulable states, non-paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and then patients who have had complications at the time when you had the procedure, because you stop the anticoagulation and restart after the, uh, you know, the, um, the device is implanted. These are the high-risk patients who develop device-related thrombus. They are not benign. That's the biggest problem. The risk of stroke is probably it's also amplified because they have a thrombus now on top of all these problems they have. So uh, currently at this point of time, we can only use, obviously, the by guidelines. It was a big debate in the FDA whether to approve or not. It became a big challenge. The industry was a big push there in order to get this thing approved, as you may, you may or may not know. I think that's one of the things. The epicardial devices seem to be overall, uh, you know, seem to be much more reasonable that way, especially when it comes to surgical methods. Uh, where, uh, if the patient is going in for surgery, for some other reason, you can do an left uh, uh, exclusion. In fact, the indication is uh, falling into class in class 1B, if I'm not mistaken. It's much higher as opposed to class 2A in the, in the case what you are seeing. So um, I think that's something you need to keep that in mind. Now, the Champion AF is obviously ongoing, and we are actually participating in the Catalyst AF trial with AMLA. Um, So it is interesting, but um, uh, I think the whole, whole shift of the industry is moving towards uh, the first modality of treatment as the left atrial appendage occlusion is still a very debatable question. We have to wait and see which way it is going to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's why probably the ACC is still very hesitatingly given it to a uh, indication for uh, so I think uh, because as long as you can still I, I still don't know who are the high re bleeding risk patients a niche niche population isn't it you can still manage Absolutely. them uh, bleeding and somehow continue NOACs and get the same kind of results that you probably would go in with uh, such an invasive uh, therapy expensive in our part of the this part of the world so that's why it's not again taken off that well here yeah you're yeah. absolutely right in fact uh, one of the problems is, uh, you know, I think uh, as much as we know, I think the appendage is the major source. They still, the stroke risk is not that much diminished. And there is a big uh, movement in talking about atrial myopathy once again. Then are we really tackling these patients with uh, uh, without anticoagulation and you know, reducing the stroke risk? So I think uh, those are the uh, many unanswered questions. And like you said, the parallel the leaks. The device leaks. Yes. The leaks start off mm -hmm. much later, and again you are uh, at a risk. Yes. Of, uh, yes. So. Yeah. This is. A, it's very disturbing to see the data coming after 365 days when no uh, people stop doing the transesophageal echo and uh, uh, go through the single antiplatelet drug therapy at that time. So it's actually disturbing to see these things happening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Venkat. One question interesting on the chat box. Uh, this is by Dr. Shakti Vail. Placing an atrial lead uh, in this case where you have atrial fibrillation, uh, what are the thoughts in especially in permanent atrial fibrillation? Will it restore sinus rhythm with better control of heart failure and risk factors? Uh, Dr. Satish, would you like to make a comment on this? Understand the question. Uh, 
placing an atrial lead in permanent atrial fibrillation, he says, could be useful once you restore sinus rhythm for better control of heart failure and risk factors. After better control, probably. What he's trying to say is after yeah. better control of heart failure and risk factors, if you can convert permanent... I think, I think what, what he's saying is whether the frequent APC is uh, triggering up for atrial fibrillation so that... Uh, I know. Placing an atrial it, lead, he says. Something interesting. You put the atrial pace so that there is no APC, suppress the APC, I don't know. Probably. That's what I think. Isn't it? That's what we would think of. Somebody yeah. who's having paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or high atrial burden, if you overdrive the atrium, especially in six sinus syndrome, probably you might be able to, in some subset of patients, you might be able to suppress atrial fibrillation in the long run. I think it, it, that's the only concept I can think of. What are your thoughts, Dr. Venkat? Um, you know, if you're looking at uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and uh, placing the atrium, it's uh, still a debatable question because we don't have a lot of data. Uh, one of the th problems I have is, uh, you know, you know, when you're facing the right atrial appendage, um, you know, you still, uh, if the intraatrial delay is significant, your your dispersion is still there, and the dispersion is, uh, is I mean, mechanistically speaking, um, you know, you are not free from getting uh, atrial fibrillation. But if you have, as you mentioned, um, this is another entity. I think we we haven't touched upon is the PAC is causing the atrial myopathy. And uh, the concept actually was, uh, it uh, came to me to review the paper years ago, um, and looking at the Spain imaging, what it does to the atrial, uh, you know, uh, function. In fact, it does very similar to what you see with PVC induced cardiomyopathy, similar to that atrial dysfunction. In those group of patients, it will be interesting concept to look at it, whether atrial pacing will change anything, because you are changing the way that it's almost like uh, doing an AV node ablation and having are the, um, uh, you know, in the his bundle pacing or the left bundle area pacing to regularize. And similarly, the you are you changing the activity in the atrium? And hence, you know, it, this causes, uh, this, you can reduce this. So it, it's, uh, we don't have a lot of information at this point to really make uh, any suggestions, but I think it's an interesting question. Maybe the dual site atrial pacing might uh, be an answer for this kind of a situation. That that is correct. I think uh, that may be or even the Bachman bundle. Bachman uh, bundle. Pacing. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. One more question to both the moderators. This is by Dr. Shreyas. If patient condition compels to use anticoagulation like high Chatsworth score, but the patient again has a high has blood risk, what would the anticoagulation be in this situation? I would request both the moderators to give their comments. Yeah, no, very good question. In fact, you know that uh, uh, one of the uh, drugs which has been uh, in uh, epixaban or the endoxaban, endoxaban are the two drugs seem to be having less chance of causing intracranial bleed compared to any other drug so far we have seen. Um, so uh, a, a GI bleed seems to be considered non-fatal bleed and uh, the intracranial obviously is the more um, high risk bleeds. And uh, if you have to use the anticoagulation, I think probably you have to use those. Uh, keeping in mind, I think sometimes the reversible agents are not the case, uh, uh, there. Um, I think uh, uh, if, uh, if for some reason, I think you have to use, I think where, you know, warfarin is, uh, uh, in, unless it's uh, you know, therapeutic, it won't be effective when it comes to the effective, effectivity status, uh, uh, Stage, but the reversibility is there. That's the only difference. Where you, when you, and you know the numbers where the INR is uh, going to sit. So, but the trials are clear. I think uh, the the bleeding risks seem to be less uh, less uh, common. So uh, common when it comes to epixaban. Having said that, we were participating in this new trial which was happening, uh, which is the factor 11A inhibition, the SNDXTN trial. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, the OCN SKA trial, they just called off saying mm -hmm. there's, uh, you know, last week uh, to stop the trial, uh, partly because the efficacy seemed to be the DSMB uh, committee actually got together and they unblinded and found that the efficacy was lower. So phase two trials was very promising, but the phase three trial fell apart. So we have to, uh, so the patients that we enrolled, we have to call them and we have to switch them. 
So I wish it was the it was the drug which was available because they mechanistically speaking, it made sense that the risk of bleeding was much lower than even a pixabanic really had this one. Unfortunately, the efficacy seemed to be a problem there. That that's news to me because we were also part you know supposed to participate in this trial. The mm -hmm. thing. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is news to me that it's being called off. So that that's that's yeah. really bad. Just just <laughs> last week. <laughs> oh, right, 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 right. That's yeah. nice. Dr. Satish, your comments? Yeah, yeah I, I agree with uh, Dr. Vedkat, sir. Apixaban is a better uh, drug there. So, uh, main thing we are only concerned about intracranial bleeding. Others are uh, less, GI are very, other side bleedings are less fatal compared to uh, IC bleed. Thank you. And then one more uh, question in the chat box. I think this we did allude to, but uh, just to reiterate, uh, Dr. Prashant Salve says, Post MVR patients with permanent atrial fibrillation and recurrent heart failure would be a candidate for AV nodal ablation and pacemaker. Yes, that, <laughs> I think this is the ideal uh, subset for uh, AVJ ablation and the pacing. This will be the ideal subset. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, thanks for coming. Yeah, I think that will be the ideal patient where you know you can't restore uh, sinus rhythm patient has an atrial fibrillation and you're trying all kinds of drugs, patient has compromised LV function, you have limited use of anti mix to either amutron. So obviously, this is, I think, probably a subset of patient where AV nodal ablation would uh, hold the fort. And what all the AVG ablation spacing we have done is, uh, few, uh, it's all rheumatic heart patients where we have done AVG ablation and uh, pacing. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Satish. Uh, I think so. We are running short of time, and then probably we have to conclude the session. It's been a very, very interesting session with a uh, lot of questions and answers and beautiful insights by the uh, moderators, Dr. Venkat and Dr. Satish, and uh, a good host of uh, presentations by uh, all the cardiologists from the Ramaya uh, Medical College. I thank one and all. A uh, few last comments from both take-home messages from Dr. Venkat and Dr. Satish, and then we would conclude. So we can have Dr. Venkat to give his uh, take-home message. Okay. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Dr. Prakash, for inviting me. And it has been an excellent uh, uh, you know, experience as well as participation and hearing from all the speakers and a lot of insight from many people and, uh, and the challenges that you have to face in the rheumatic and the uh, non-valvular atrial fibrillation. And uh, nice to meet you, Dr. Pratish, as well. Uh, so the um, as the atrial fibrillation is, uh, is an evolving time. We all know, and especially the non-valvular atrial fibrillation, particularly here. But it's, uh, with the word of caution being uh, is, uh, you know, the trials are all good. And uh, the, we need to make sure that we don't get biased by what it comes through. I think it has to be taken one step um, back and one step forward to see how wh what we understand from these trials. Mm, and um, uh, the first uh, first thing is to prevent the stroke. That's probably one of the uh, key things. And uh, you know, stratifying these patients, how we actually manage uh, to reduce the risk of stroke is probably the first line of therapy we need to think about. Then comes the rate and rhythm question. I think there's a big shift in how we are actually managing these patients from um, you know, rate control now is more in terms of rhythm control. And John Cam is right. I think at some point we are going to change how we are going to look at it. Now, when it comes to symptoms, this has been a debate. What exactly are the symptoms? Sometimes we see the heart failure, we see the heart rate, these are the only symptoms. We are also seeing one element of a problem, which is the silent cerebral infarction. And uh, the, the these things uh, tend to happen a lot more commonly than we actually think it is. And the other Jared Bunch, the big study, uh, the population-based study in the cohort looked at was the development of dementia. And uh, so I think the atrial fibrillation, I think, is an increasingly a big problem. It's, it's becoming more like a pandemic proportion. Uh, by 2030, I think the expectation of uh, atrial fibrillation uh, prevalence will be very high. I think um, we need to address this at the grassroots level in the form of looking at all the um, life lifestyle modification. I think probably that is very important thing when it comes to what has been done. Press Sanders has shown time and again, and uh, it is one way to 
really make multi motivate the patients. Here it is very difficult in US to do that because patients will shop for physicians to get an ablation done. Um, and uh, one of the key things he did was to win the heart of the patient to have them understand what the problem is. Treating all the things like sleep apnea to you know hypertension control, all these things are extremely important as a first step. And uh, even if you do an ablation, you have a best technology available. Uh, the success rate drops significantly if you don't address all these aspects. And uh, I think uh, anticoagulation alternatives, um, I think, is a uh, is obviously an extreme situation in my mind. I think we tend we are very conservative when it comes to doing the left atrial appendage uh, occlusion, um, mainly because of the fact we see only a selected group of patients who cannot really tolerate at this moment. The guidelines do change. We don't know how we are going to how it is going to happen. I think this is going to be the debate of the future. And uh, thanks once again for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Venkat. You're still looking bright and beautiful. Let this are <laughs> thanks. Thanks for your wonderful uh, insights. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your presence, Dr. Satish. Sir, I like to thank uh, V.S. Prakash and his uh, team. Such a wonderful job you've done, sir. And the presentations were so good, and we learned so many things. And I like to thank Venkat sir for his uh, inputs, and I learned so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And in India, still, uh, I think uh, what we should know is we should uh, try to put the patient uh, rhythm control. Should uh, importance of rhythm control should be learned. At the same time, because ablation has not picked up in India, at least the most important thing is lifestyle modification, as we were speaking, treating care of hypertension and mainly obstructive sleep apnea, weight loss, alcohol abstinence, this should be taken care. And present with newer oral anticoagulation, anticoagulation has become much simpler and safer. So anticoagulating this patient is uh, one more uh, important thing. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. These are my inputs from this. Thank you. Thank you once again for both the moderators and the speakers. And all the participants who were there full time and their wonderful questions. I hope we have been able to answer most of them. And I thank, thank one and all. And I would also like to rem remind that these sessions are available on Medgami and you can easily, or the IHRS website, and you can retrieve these recordings whenever you need to at convenience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Venkat. Thank you, Dr. Satish. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.